Hi, everybody. I'm Melinda Emerson, small biz lady, America's number one small business expert. And I'm excited to welcome you to tonight's edition of Small Biz Chat Live. Now, you know, the mission of Small Biz Chat is to end small business failure. And we do this show so that you can get peer-to-peer -peer business advice without paying a whole lot of money. And I've got some amazing guests here tonight. We're gonna to be talking about leadership. Like it's one thing to be a manager, but it's a whole nother thing to be a leader. We're also gonna talk about the ever struggle to hire and keep great people working for you in your business. And so many of you out here are solopreneurs. So I have an expert who's gonna walk you through some of the things that you gotta think about if you're gonna be a successful solopreneur. But you know, normally we're live on Twitter, but tonight we are live everywhere. We are streaming live on Twitter. We are broadcasting live from my Small Biz Lady fan page. And for those of you over there on YouTube, we're live over there too. So we're really excited to be with you tonight because it is all about helping America's small businesses take your business to the next level. And that's certainly what I'm about. And so what we have for you tonight is small business advice from all different angles. So let me tell you about my amazing guest tonight. We have Patrick Dewar. He is an expert in mentorship and leadership. He's got proven systems that he's going to break down for us. We've got Ojinga Carr, who is an HR expert and a high performance coach. So he's going to talk to us about what it takes to attract and keep great people working for you. And my good friend, Pamela Slim is here straight from Phoenix, Arizona. And she is going to talk to us about all things small business, all things small doing it as a solopreneur, but how to get you some help so that it doesn't break the bank, but helps you not be constantly stressed out and having these never ending to do lists. So with that, I'm really excited to invite my first guest, Patrick Dewar to the stage. He is going to, he's really a passionate about helping small business owners build, grow, scale, and flourish. And he does that by sharing his time-tested systems that guarantee results. So he's all about helping people engage their employees, increase their sales, and land more deals. He's helped over 40,000 people. You guys, that's a big number, right? Patrick didn't just start doing this. And he is here tonight to help all of us learn how to be better leaders in our businesses and how to create more success for ourselves. All right, Patrick, welcome to Small Biz Chat Live. Hey, thanks so much, Melinda. It's, it's really great to be here. I'm really honored to, to be on the, show, on the show tonight. I'm so excited to have you. You have such an amazing uh, background. I mean, there were so many places I could go with this interview, but I'm going to stick with the thing that I think people struggle with the most. And that's really leadership, right? You know, it's like, it's one thing to, I'm the boss. I, I started this business. But when you have to be the leader of your business, it's very different from being the manager of your business. And so what I want to what I want to do, because some of my audience might not be familiar with you and your background, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how did you learn these, these principles of leadership that you like to share with entrepreneurs? Sure, thanks. Uh, a lot of it really came... Uh, it started through my career in a college, beyond college, everywhere that I ever went, I ended up in as the uh, sales trainer or something of that nature, wherever I, whatever profession uh, I was in, whatever company. But it, it really be began to blossom when I understood my internal motivational gift. I was 40 years old, went through, saw this little assessment. It said teaching was my internal motivational gift. And my first thought was, no, it ain't. <laughs> Why? Well, when I was 18, first day of college, my academic advisor looked at my test scores, looked up at me and said, Mr. Dewar, do you realize that 99% of all of the rest of the freshmen enrolled are placed above you? Our statistics show that people of your academic stature won't last six weeks in this university. Are you sure you wouldn't rather go to a junior college and make sure that college is your cup of tea? See, I, all I could think was, wow, I've never been called an idiot so proficiently in all my life. <laughs> right. I'll send you an invitation to my graduation. And the thing is, is that that lie was planted at, 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 into a child's mind. When I'm 40, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, I'm not smart enough to be a teacher. But then I said, wait a minute. Through my life, because I... 
I always felt like I wasn't smart enough. I studied accelerated learning. I learned how to read really fast, remember anything I wanted, lists, presentation, names, whatever. And um, in fact, that was the first product I ever created was, was accelerated learning. And, um, and I thought, you know, maybe I'm not so stupid. I, I love to learn. I love to read. I read hundreds of books a year. Why would I think I'm anything less than that? And so confronting that limiting belief with a, an adult truth rather than the child's mind that was sewn in, I snapped the chain. I said, you know, if this gift is in me, let's see what happens. And so I began to just offer it out. And I believe that when people begin to move in their gifting and their strength, the things that they really charge up in, that they don't ever get tired. They thrive. And, and as I began to operate in that, it opened doors for me to uh, speak and present. I started tra and training that uh, information on a three-day event in 2000. I used to do it. 12, 13 times a year, every year for 10 or 12 years, uh, teaching thousands of people how to process their pain, find their purpose and their passion, walk into that gifting and really create a destiny from that, that uh, part of them that they never get tired of living. And I've been teaching so that. Let for me, let me jump years. in. Let me jump in on you, Patrick, because you just said something really important. You said, helping people process their pain. And I want to ask you, so what does helping people process their pain have to do with business leadership? Like, how does that come in? You know, here's the thing that's really tough to acknowledge. Um, would you agree with me that adults under pressure are kids in big clothing? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, just cut somebody off in traffic. What do they do? Wave and go, oh, Melinda, you deserve that spot, right? No, they probably call you number one in some other language like they do me, right? And so they're not acting mature. They're acting like a teenager. Why? Because between the ages of nine and 14 and pretty much everyone I've ever met's life, they have a peg point or two. These peg points are like stakes in their, their psyche, in their life, deep-seated. And these stakes are pains that if anything smells like it, looks like it, or feels like it in the future, we go back into that moment and relive that moment into the present, shredding our rapport and our relationships with others. Mm -hmm. You know, the challenge with leadership is, is you've got to be an adult and a professional always at work. Whether you got a small business or a larger business, the fact is, is that we are not in the day where you can lose your cool because it's called illegal. Just ask Ojinga, okay? And, and the thing is, is that when people understand that um, they, they need to be better leaders, one of the fastest ways to become a better leader and person and professional is process the pain. We need to go back and sand off those peg points and write on a new truth. Because I believe that what you believe about you is all made up anyways, and you're the author. But are you holding the pen? When I understood that I could hold the pen, I can, I could sand off those things and bring in a new story into our lives, into the lives of others. And that's, what's so important about processing the pain. I mean, I, I, I think about in my life, I was 14 years old. I had my best friends pull a prank on me. This prank was really mean. So I went to them. I said, why would you guys do that to me? And their response was, Pat, it's because we hate you. <laughs> wow. And we're amazed it's taking you so long to figure that out. And I went, really? Guys, there are a lot of ways you could have told me you hated me, but that wasn't one of them. So from that day on, if you pranked me, it meant you hate me. And I didn't need a relationship with you. I held that into my 40s until someone, a good friend of mine, Sherry Howe, came up to me one day and said, Pat, if we prank you, it means we like you. So I've been assigned to prank you until you figure that out. And, uh, and then all I could hear was be afraid. Be very afraid. And uh, because she was really good at pranks and, and, and she was going to keep her word. And she did. And a year later, I remember the day she pulled some prank and I literally fell out of my chair laughing. My stomach was hurting. And I thought, <laughs> I'm free. All Folks, right. we got to get rid of that garbage. Because the better we get in here, the better we bring to out there as leaders.
I love that. I love that. Listen, Patrick, I'm going to get you to put a pin in that for us. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about mentoring. We're going to talk about how you can mentor your employees into having great results. So I'm Melinda Emerson. You're watching Small Biz Chat Live and we're going to be right back. Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. I know you might be thinking about quitting your business and going back into corporate America, but wait, before you give up, my new book, Fix Your Business, could give you a whole new lease on life. My 12 P's of running a successful business will walk you through step by step how to grow your business revenue, how to hire great people and streamline your processes and so much more. Grab a copy today of Fix Your Business and get your life back. Welcome back. You're watching Small Biz Chat Live. We've been talking with Patrick Dewar, and he's talking to us about how to be a better leader in our small business. And who are you leading? Well, you're leading your employees. So Patrick, I want to get back to you and talk about, um, you know, how do you, what do you think are the keys to mentoring your employees to create great results? Like, how do you do that? So one of the things that I would always encourage leaders to do is to find out what's the strength, the epicenter, the passion zone uh, of the people that you lead. If you understand their passion and you tie it to the, the, the profession that they're in and the mission of the organization, then you've got activated people and they always will serve you better and, and, and be uh, better to you and better and more profitable for the whole company. Um, the, the way I do that is I, I have people take a little six to seven question test uh, that gives me the identity of their core internal motivational gift because if I understand their epicenter, then everything changes. Uh, you know, when I said teaching was my internal motivational gift, that's one of seven that, that I teach. And, and the list is not like never heard of before. It's, it's, it's mercy, teaching, serving, giving, professing, exhortation, administration. And when someone understands their, their gift, then I begin to pull that and place them where they need to be so that those things are what guide them and drive them rather than me. As a mentor, you're always trying to take them and put them in a place where they can thrive. But the other thing to realize is that the gifts balance each other. The more that we understand the gifts, the more that we understand how they balance each other, and how to motivate people, the more you can mentor others to do the same thing you did, which is what I did for years and years. Uh, my job in that, that three-day event is to, to mentor others to, to replace me. And I, I would, had a real knack for it. I had lots of people that went through a two-year program of mentoring where they actually uh, could do what I did and lead a three-day weekend like I did. And, um, and it's, it's just a process. So I've heard you say before that leaders are learners. So I'm a busy business owner. I have a never ending to do list. How do I make time to learn more? Cause I'm so busy trying to keep up with, you know, making the donuts, paying the people that help me make the donuts. You know I mean? There's a lot of stuff that I got going on. How do I make time? Well, there's a couple of things you could do. One, you learn how to, to uh, get the right information. Um, learn how to remember and process that information faster, read faster, remember more, and then take action is always the key. But I remember when I was in corporate America, uh, the day, the hours that I was there were theirs is what they thought. And I didn't have a lot of time to, um, to learn on the job. Biggest mistake somebody can do is think that between the hours of whenever they're on their job, that they're going to get to learn a whole lot other than what the job wants you to learn. Um, I own my career. I, I expect people to take ownership of their lives and their careers to step in and take action. And so, you know, yeah, there's some things you can learn that will help you to uh, learn more faster. The other thing is just redeem the time. Mm -hmm. My mentor asked me a wonderful question. Um, he said, Pat, how, how long is your drive to work? 
Well, back then it was about 35 minutes. He said, would you consider converting 20 minutes of that, that drive time into what he called was automobile university? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I could do that. He goes, you know, every time you do that, uh, uh, for just 20 minutes a day, every six months, you're getting the equivalent of a college course internalized. Mm -hmm. You know, what's amazing about that is that when I went to school, yes, the earth was cooling because it only cost $8 a credit hour for me to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> I look pretty good for a 150 year old, huh? But actually the, the thing is, is that now that school charges three, $400 and most do three, four, $500 a credit hour. That's a pretty good return on investment just a little bit each day and so if I did that my skills went up now being able to process information read faster remember more those are always really good and uh, you know that's one of the things that I always encourage people to learn and there's lots of resources out there um, that can help people with that mm. but it's all about it's all about taking the time make, make All right. Well, you know what? No, I really yeah. appreciate. I really appreciated ah. that, Patrick. Thank you so much. We have got to get to our next guest, Ojinga Kari. You talked about him earlier. He's going to give us the ins and outs of working with employees and keeping them if they're good ones. So I'm Melinda Emerson. You're watching Small Biz Chat Live, and we'll be right back. <laughs> My new book, Fix Your Business, is really about encouraging people to take back control of their business and change how their businesses is run. It's not okay to skip paychecks. It's not okay to never feel like you can take a vacation. And it's also not okay to not know how much profit you've made in your business until your taxes are done. I really want business owners to stop letting their businesses be runaway trains. I've written this book to teach people processes and systems to help them run their businesses intentionally. My goal is to help existing entrepreneurs create a business that allows them to live their dream life. Everybody. I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady. Welcome back to Small Biz Chat Live. Now we're talking about employees. Now, how do you find them? How do you attract them to want to work for you? And then how do you keep them? Because we all know in this era, it's hard to keep folks past about two or three years of employment. So I reached out to one of the top HR experts that I know who's going to help us figure out how to manage our small businesses and attract and keep great folks working for us. So I have invited Ojinka Carr, one of the top HR experts and high performance coaches I know to join us. You know, he's an author, he's an expert in organizational structure, he's an HR consultant, he's been doing it over 18 years. He's experienced in sales, management, HR, and his passion is dealing with change and helping people work through it and preparing for it. Ojinga Carr, welcome to Small Biz Chat Live. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me here. You know, I love being, being here with your tribe and just getting a chance to opportunity to serve. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And I'm neglected to say that you're also the author of Your Limitless Life, which is a great book. I've read it. I Everyone needs to grab a copy because it's good, good stuff. Um, so tell me, what do I need to do even before I start looking for an employee? Because I think a lot of times we just think, I got to find somebody. Like, what do I need to do internally in my business to make sure that I'm ready to even go out and attract an employee? 
Well, one of the biggest things in order to be able to attract great employees is to know exactly what it is that you want. That's the biggest thing. What do you need an employee for? Do you need a part-time employee? Do you need a full-time employee? Do you need someone who's going to, what what roles are they going to actually fulfill in your business? That's a huge thing. Just understanding what are, what are they going to fulfill? What is it that we want them to be able to do? And, and how does that fit into really alignment into our business? That's one of the biggest things. Can we bring people into our business that are in alignment with our goals and are in alignment in what it is that we want to get done? And so before you even think about it, before you even think about um, bringing that employee on, before you write that job description, first understand what it is that you want and need for someone to be able to do. Is it someone in a small business? Do we have the funds set aside in order to be able to make that happen? Um, the hiring process is expensive as well, too. And so do we understand how to be able to get through that structure and be able to get that done? So that's big and important. So you mentioned job descriptions. Tell me about that. How important are they? And then how often should they be updated? So absolutely with your job descriptions, they should be something that most of what happens is that many of us write a paragraph job description and at the bottom of it, we write and other duties as a sign. <laughs> and that's what we put there. And that's all it is that we have, right? And so there's this whole phantom list of other duties that we're going to assign them later on that we're not even sure whether they can actually do and they're not sure whether they want to do or any piece as far as with that. So when you're writing a job description, you want to be able to write a job description that's a one page, a two page, a five page job description. It includes every recurring duty that your employee would have, every recurring duty. So if they start having a duty that's not in their job description that starts to recur, rewrite their job description. You can do it whenever you want. And at the bottom of that job description, you're going to include a statement that will protect you and help you legally, that'll help you be able to do so. And that is, can you perform the essential functions of the job? When you have someone sign off on the fact they can perform the essential functions of the job, what they're saying is they can do that actual job and that, that you have shared with them what those, what those pieces of the position is. And so by doing that, now everybody's clear on what we want. Jobs, understand that jobs and hiring is just relationships. So if you have something that you want out of a relationship, you probably should be clear with your partner on this is something that I'd like to be able to have out of my relationship. And so it's the same thing in a business. It says, hey, this is what we need to be able to get done. And, we, and what we want to do is make sure that you do it legally, that you don't just bring out all kind of willy-nilly willy -nilly stuff, but that we do it legally. So. so what makes a great startup employee? Like, you know, I'm just starting my business. I might be hiring my first or second employee. What makes a great startup employee? So we have to stop looking at things old school. I'm of a certain age now where I remember what it was like when I got started with my first job. And it was kind of like, whatever it is, you do whatever it is the person tells you to do. And that's just it. It's about building partnerships is what it really is about. How can we create partners? So what we're doing is that we're creating partnerships with people who are going to grow our business and grow and be able to do it. So like many times your first employee might be that admin person. And that admin person is going to be able to help you be able to figure out how to get some of those little things done that we don't necessarily like to do because we love our business and we love the, the big picture of our business, but there's these small things that need, get, that need to get done. Another great startup position that we end up in is getting um, a salesperson um, because no matter whatever it is you do in your business, whether you're a nonprofit, you still need someone to be soliciting and being able to get nonprofit donations and being able to set those things apart and those different things. So it has to be something that creates money and influx into your business. And so a great startup employee is someone who believes in what it is that you're doing. So in order for them to believe in that, then you have to know what it is that you want and what it is you want to get done as well. Too. Mm -hmm. So once I know that, what is the best place for me to go and recruit talent? Like, I mean, because nowadays most of the stuff is done online. So what, what do you say are like the top resources to use to like go post a job description? So it's important when you're posting a job description, you can go out and go to all the help wanted sites and those different things with that. But what's important is making sure that you have a great job description that, that, that uh, speaks to the essential functions of the job. So you have these essential functions and the essential things that you need to get done within the job and within the position. And that's important to know that first. It really isn't necessarily about where you're posting. 
it's about knowing what it is that you want. Now, many times when you are growing your business and that's what you're doing, understand that if we don't hire well, then that's the place where many of our businesses will hemorrhage cash. And so it makes sense to, when you're hiring, many times to get a hiring person to do that for you, to outsource that out. If you can get someone who does a great job at that, where they can help you find great people and where you can be really clear on how to be able to get those things done. So yes, you can run in. Yes, you can go to whatever help on it.com. You can go to monster in those different places, but you're going to spend a lot of, you've got to look at how many man hours am I spending doing work? What I, what I look, what we ask our clients all the time is what is it that you want to be able to make out of this business? Okay. So what is it that you, what is your yearly goal that you'd like to be able to make? Right. And then you take that yearly goal. Let's say that that yearly goal is a hundred thousand dollars and you're going to work for uh, 400 hours in a year on your, on your business. Okay. And that means you need to make $25 an hour. So the question that you have to ask yourself when you're talking about hiring processes is, am I doing $25 an hour work or am I doing $7 or $10 an hour work, doing the work, trying to do, get every little small thing done? Because what we want to do is to be thinking about the big picture of how it is that we can be visionary leaders in our business, if that makes sense. It does. It does. So listen, I'm going to stop you right there. We're going to go to commercial. When we come back, I want to talk to you about how do I afford a benefits package when I really can't afford a benefits package? So we're going to talk about benefits and all that good stuff when we deal with a little bit more of HR. This is Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady. You're watching Small Biz Chat Live, and we will be right back. Are you tired of struggling in your business, not taking a paycheck, dreading dealing with your business in the morning? Are you regretting even starting your business in the first place? Well, I know you're tired, and I also remember what that kind of tired is like. But the good news is, it's time to stop feeling that way. Stop! I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, and my new book, Fix Your Business, is a 90-day turnaround plan to get back your life and reduce chaos in your business. I've been in business nearly 20 years, and let me teach you how to build a business that works for you. Grab a copy today. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Small Biz Chat Live. I'm Melinda Emerson. We're talking with HR expert and high performance coach, Ojinga Carr. And he was just dropping knowledge on us about HR best practices, how to go hire people. What do you need to think about first before you do it? And now we're up to the big question I want to ask him, which is, okay, I need to hire people, but I don't necessarily as a small business owner have money for a big you know, corporate benefits package. What can I do to incentivize people to still want to work for me if I can't offer them what a corporate job could offer them? So people think that it's all about the benefits and all about the money with employees. There was a recent article um, that was about the five things that are most important to your employees. Five things are most important to your employees. Those five things are benefits, paycheck, who they work with, who they work for, what they do. Benefits, paycheck, who they work with, who they work for, and what they do. Now, those are not in the order of importance, though. So what do you think is the number one most important thing to your employees? What do you think is the number one most important thing to your employees? Who they work with? And you're absolutely right. That's why you're the small biz lady. So, <laughs> if, right. Who they work I with. I read that article, too. <laughs> exactly. Who they work for what they do, paycheck, and then the benefits. People think that we have to pay our employees. You cannot pay your employees enough money to be happy. That's the thing. You can't pay your employees enough money to be happy, all right? Um, baseball players make enough money to get be, be happy. They get $400 million in, 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 in different things as far as for over five years, okay? They make enough money to be happy. So what we have to do is build workplaces where we can build happiness with that. So if you have stakeholders who you work with, they care about what it is that they're doing. If they care about what it is that, that we're accomplishing, then yes, you have to pay them, absolutely. But people will stay in a job where they're happy, in a job where they're making less money, 
than whether you could take a job and make more money and be unhappy and, you know, be one foot in the grave where you are with the job and be able to do it. OK. And so, yes, benefits are important. But what's important is the culture in the workplace that you create. And so the way that we create that culture in that workplace is with non-cash incentives, non-cash incentives. Um, you'd be surprised what somebody would do for a gold star. What your, <laughs> what your employees are really reaching for is really recognition. And so we find this in organizations that struggle all the time, that your employees just start doing stuff because they get written up over it. And it's still recognition. It's kind of like with kids, honestly. Just like Pat said, you're dealing with adults, with kids in adult, in, a, in adult clothing, okay? And so we, whatever it is you're building, so when people feel like I'm a part of something, I'm going to work and I'm a part of something, not that I'm just going and I'm like in an episode of The Office where I'm just pushing TPS reports or whatever, and that's it. But when I feel like I'm a part of something, then that's when people grow. And so when you do that and you create that, and that's what makes a difference in your business. And that's what makes a difference for you to be able to keep high performing employees. All right. So I don't have necessarily the space or money for a ping pong table or, you know, a foosball tournament area. So, you know, you say create a great work environment, create a great culture. Is, are those the kind of perks and things people are really expecting? Well, not like unless if you're working at Google, yeah. I mean, you know what I'm saying? They want you need to have like all kind of stretched luxury things that they because you're working all that time in order to do it. What I mean by non-cash incentives, it is running contests for your employees. And if they win, then they get um, a day off or a massage package, or maybe you maybe you work with one of your vendors and be able to work out how to get some baseball tickets or whatever, or different things along those lines in order to be able to do it. And what it does that allows you to be able to offer these things. And so your employee feels great about that because they're like, hey, this person cares about me. And so that's what allows us to build the type of leadership it is to where you can have it. It makes you an authentic leader to your employee and not just a title leader. A title leader, you have to respect them because they have a title. All right. But an authentic leader, you feel like that they care about you and they care about you and who you are. Authentic leaders don't have to be at the front of the room. They can they can they can help you from there. Many times in our lives with our kids, we're not even the title leaders in our own life as our as parents. You tell your kids something and they look at their sibling and say, is this OK or whatever after you're gone? OK. And so that's the thing. So it's about developing that authentic leadership that we can develop within organizations, which is what puts it together. Understand, organizations need two things, human capital and organizational structure, okay? If human capital and organizational structure. So with human capital, it's your people, your people and what it is you do with them. The new organizational structure is how it is that you build an organization for those people to be able to thrive. All right, so one of the things I know about the the work environment these days you got multiple generations of people in the workforce and that and that's really kind of a lot to manage but the other thing that i have been reading about as it relates to and this is particularly uh, relevant as it relates to you know millennial employees is that they they want to know they all want to make a difference right they all want to know why they're doing what it is they're doing but as an employer i'm like I just want a great assistant. <laughs> like, I just right. want somebody that answers the phone well and keeps my, you know, schedule on point so that I don't show up over here when I need to be over here. Like, so how how can I make, uh, you know, menial tasks meaningful to somebody who wants to feel like they're making a difference, they're changing the world? Like, how do how do we do that? So, I um, my dad taught me chess at a young age. And so I love chess. And so even a pawn on a chessboard can be the most powerful piece. And so what we have to communicate to our employees, it's not about just telling your employees anymore that it's because I said so. All right. It doesn't work that way. So what we have to communicate to our employees is what that small task means to the larger piece. So because they are able to get you to the meeting on time and to the right place, that's how we keep the lights on. 
because we keep to work and do it because they're helping with this project that's going to help with this part and so it's about it's about stories honestly is what it is it's really about the stories it is that we craft and that we tell in our business and who it is so high performing organizations are great at crafting stories all right so you know there's peak performance and high performance when i play ball we were peak performance we get up for the game and then we get back down because it was after the game for the two hours high performance is about developing long-term performance at this area where all we can do is level up we continue to keep leveling up and be able to do so and so if you want to create a high performing organization you got to learn how to tell stories that's what it really is. It's about what is the story of what we do. When you see organizations that do well, when you when you give to the World Wildlife Fund at at, uh, at night, it's because they told you a great story about what, what they were going to do with those animals. It's the same thing in your business. When you're dealing with millennials and Gen Zers and everyone as far as that, people want to care. We are gone are the days where you worked for 40 years for someone and you got a gold watch. And that was it. And you broke rocks every day, like like Fred Flint. So those days are gone. So we have to work with the people that we have and be able to make it happen. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Well, you know what? I got one last question for you. And that is, what is the biggest mistake that businesses make with their talent? The biggest mistake that businesses make with their talent is not communicating well. And that's appropriate change communication. Okay. So what happens is that we are ever flowing, all right? Who would have thought 15 years ago that we would all have television studios in our pocket with our phones and that we could get on this thing called the internet? Who knew that Al Gore was going to invent the internet and that we would all be able to get on the internet and be able to talk about business and be able to do those things 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? So our businesses are constantly shifting. And so if you're still doing business, or if your people are still doing business the way they used to, and we haven't communicated that to them, then now that's an issue and a problem within our organizations, okay? And so the worst thing that we can do is not communicate with our employees because then they feel like that they are not important. And if your employees don't feel like they're important, then they start making choices based on money. And if your employees start making choices based on, based on money, it's not gonna work out. And so it's all about the communication and making sure that we flow. It's not about, oh, I'm holding their hands through everything. It's like, yo, this is what we need to get done. And this is why we need to get it done. And that's really important. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jenga Carr, thank you so much for coming on Small Biz Chat Live. You've given us so many amazing pearls tonight. And, you know, I I, I think I'm going to be a better manager because of you. I, I really think that. So thank you so much for giving us this great information. And when we come back, we're going to talk with Pamela Slim about how to be a successful solopreneur. I can't wait to talk to her and you're going to want to hear what she has to say. So stay with us. We'll be right back on Small Biz Chat Live. Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. I know you might be thinking about quitting your business and going back into corporate America, but wait, before you give up, my new book, Fix Your Business, could give you a whole new lease on life. My 12 P's of running a successful business will walk you through step by step how to grow your business revenue, how to hire great people and streamline your processes and so much more. Grab a copy today of Fix Your Business and get your life back. Hi everybody, I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, America's number one small business expert, and you are watching Small Biz Chat Live. Now the mission of Small Biz Chat is to end small business failure, and we are here with a panel of guest experts who are giving us that insider information on how to take our businesses to the next level. And my next guest is no exception. You know, of the 26 million small businesses in the United States, 20 million of them or solopreneurs that work out of the back bedroom of their house. I call them spare room tycoons, right? And I'm so excited to have Pamela Slim here tonight. Pam Slim, my friend, she is gonna talk to us about the kind of things that you need to be thinking about if you are a army of one in your business. Um, I started that way, I'm not that way now, but she did too, and she wrote this amazing book years ago called Escape from Cubicle Nation, which is really all about setting up 
of business, your, your first business. And so I'm so excited to have her here today because she is a national speaker, author, and small business coach. And she specializes in helping service businesses grow and scale through intellectual property. She and her husband, Daryl, opened uh, the Main Street Learning Lab in Mesa, Arizona in 2016, where they work with diverse entrepreneurs on their core business challenges. Pam, welcome to Small Biz Chat Live. I am so happy to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making the time. You know, I, I think we, we, you know, there's a difference between sort of like the work from home person and somebody who is a solopreneur. So can you, can we first just talk about like, what does it mean to be a solopreneur? Are there any advantages to being a solopreneur? I think so. There, there is a lot of language around it. I think sometimes just work from home can be side hustle. It can be people who are working remotely. It's just a way we're all more and more familiar of even for folks who are employees. Solopreneurs, in my experience, are people who very conscientiously want to really have a simple, focused business, but really to treat it as a serious business. And so they have to focus on the same kinds of things foundationally that people do that grow and scale larger businesses. But often it's people who have multiple talents, want to be really wise with their resources, and to be really focused on providing a great service. Awesome. 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 So the one thing that I think about as a solopreneur is like, it's just you, right? So how do you manage juggling everything that's on your plate? Well, and I think so often, uh, at first, I, just like you, I did everything. I created my own super ugly website and blog. I look back at it now. I'm like, wow, did I really do that? But it served the purpose, which I'm so glad. Sometimes you have to do everything yourself. I think with flexible resources these days that rarely do solopreneurs do everything themselves. So they should have somebody who's maybe a CPA. <clears throat> you could have a contract bookkeeper. You can even have a virtual assistant that might be doing certain tasks for you. And of course, this does depend on the kind of budget and resources that you have. Like any kind of focus on um, strengths for a leader or, or a manager within a large company, over time, it is unlikely that a solopreneur is going to have all the skills and strengths necessary in order to run a business. So I think you have to be focused. I think you have to choose your lane in what you do. I see a lot with my clients that you do, in selecting your business, want to choose something that's really a fit for your personality type or the way you take action. So mm -hmm. I know I love being a business coach because I love being in the moment, focusing with people, getting things done, and it doesn't involve tons of follow-up and details and follow through that's not the most exciting thing for me so i think business choice is really important as well so when i'm thinking about i'm a solopreneur and i'm setting up my home office i mean is it like you know i work from my living room with my pajamas on and my feet up and i'm working on my laptop or you know do you really need to set up a, a formal a workspace to work from I was working with a client here yesterday at the lab, and I think I have far too many feelings about this. So let's just be clear about that. I feel it's so important to have a space that is really dedicated as an office and to make sure, first of all, you have a door. If you have loved ones, if you have pets, if you have children or all three, you need to be able to have a space where you can be quiet, where you won't be disturbed and where you're also really organized. One of my dear friends, Charlie Gilkey, who I used to run retreats with uh, for a long time at, over at Productive Flourishing, he said to think about Iron Man, if you've ever seen that movie and where Tony Stark walks into his lab and he has every single thing that he needs right within just the perfect height. And he you know, swoops in the air and his screen comes and he has exactly his tools. That is the level to which I think people should have an office that they love. So don't just kind of have things flying all over the place. It can get lost. It looks sloppy. And uh, like Patrick and I were talking about before, I think it does make a difference. If you're doing a call with a client and they see a bunch of laundry behind you and, you know, see the pets kind of coming and going, it, if you're trying to convey that you are a pro, it's not really going to be supportive of that. I completely agree with you. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, so how do you hold yourself accountable as a solopreneur? 
I actually find the accountability is easier because if you don't produce or do business development, you don't eat. Like it's actually kind of easier to be accountable than when you might be an employee where regardless of what's happening, you might get a check. You, you obviously have some visibility into your performance, but very, very quickly you see that if you do not take care of the kind of business activities that you need to, you're going to be in a world of hurt. You'll be overwhelmed with work. You won't have clients. Um, you are will be chased after by the IRS, right? A whole bunch of things that you need to take care of. So know that that's a good thing and that it's very important and there are consequences for not taking actions. I think simple things can be making sure that you take time out each week and each month in order to do planning so you know what your priorities are and it's really clear at the beginning of the day exactly what it is that you need to focus on. And then to use some kinds of tools where you can organize your activities so that you're really clear what needs to get done. What I find with a lot of clients is it's usually not so much getting people to do things, it's actually getting them to stop and not just constantly be working on the business, especially if they're working from home. So that's why it's really critical to know what you need to get done today, this week, and then once you do it, to let yourself rest and rejuvenate. And then how do we deal with like cash flow challenges in, in a business? I mean, because I know that big businesses and small businesses run on cash. So when you're a solopreneur and you're running into a cash crunch, how do you handle that? Well, cash flow challenges come from a whole number of sources, and it is one of the top problems that people face. You do need to make sure that you are doing business development because that's where you can get in business droughts. You do need to have really clear offerings and good payment options where if you're a consultant coach that as much as possible, you want to get payment up front or you want to have milestones set where it's phased, not just depending upon the work, because sometimes the client can delay the work, but really that's by date. So let's say every 30 days you might get payment. And the other thing is to really activate any kinds of uh, lines of credit or um, resources that you might use when you are in a cash flow crunch. For anybody who's still in their corporate job, I often recommend that they really look into that while they still have a paycheck because they could be a little bit more um, attractive to banks w to get things like a line of credit when they when they have a paycheck that, that when they go out on their own. And the other thing is just to be really um, prudent. A lot of people overestimate what they think is going to happen. They might underestimate the amount of money that they need to have in their account. So it's been really proactive. And I've become a big enthusiast of Mike McCallowich's Profit First, if you're familiar with that book and kind of system. I've started to become an evangelist. You know, I know Mike, but I'm like, oof, where you know what your numbers are, you know what the profit is, it's going to make you smarter about the cash situation in your business. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so when you're thinking about, um, you know, the best way to grow the business as you know, you, you, how do you avoid as a solopreneur, not just like creating a job for yourself, but actually having a business? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know because it, I think the distinction can be if somebody is, is more where you might have few clients, where you're acting more as a contractor, where they're the probably easiest test that you have is if by some reason, by choice or by force, you went away, would there be a business there? <laughs> is there an activity that you're doing that you could teach somebody else to do? Is there a product you have for sale that somebody else could sell? And that's kind of the quickest litmus test for if there is an actual business there, it can include your intellectual property um, or the system that you've created. But if you are the only person who is delivering all the time, then that can be the case where you can get really exhausted and you are more always dependent on being the one who's uh, required to be there to do all of the work. Right. Now, I know that you've been an entrepreneur for a long time. I've been in business for 20 years. I don't know how long you've been in, but I know it's just about that much. Or 23. Long. Yeah, 23. Oh, yeah. So tell me, what are some, I mean, we're so fortunate now to have so much technology, so many apps, so many tools. What are some of your favorite tech tools for solopreneurs? You know, one of them we're using now, I use Zoom every day of the week, right, for webinars, for coaching calls. I really do enjoy it. I think it's great. I love the breakout room function, if anybody's ever used that when you're running a group where participants can actually talk with each other like you and I are talking. So you could be delivering a class, break people up into groups, and it's a nice way to mimic what happens in a live setting. 
Um, I like daylight as a way to kind of manage client relationship project plans. Um, and you know, it's funny cause I'm not, I don't, I'm not really a tech heavy person. Um, I have been advocating Slack a lot more for clients that are working on projects. Like when you have project teams, especially people that are all over the world. Um, but I, I tend to think to keep things kind of lean, you know, Google docs and few apps, but really getting clarity about the core business processes that underlie them. I think that's good stuff. So how important is it to schedule lunch and regular breaks when you're a solopreneur? Oh my goodness. It is very important. I'm um, rolling my eyes because I don't always do it. <laughs> I don't either. That's why oh, I'm asking. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I had lunch at three o'clock today, so it's not really a good model. And it is really critical. One is just putting that block within your schedule. Probably like you, I have an assistant that's always, I always have you know, meetings flying around. I have clients in different time zones that can't always meet in different places. So I often accommodate uh, client schedules, but it is very important to stand up, move around, make sure you have time for lunch. Don't just eat it sitting in front of your computer like I did today, because over time, those are the things that are really going to get you in, in, uh, in, in not a good state. Yeah. Yeah. Burnout is real. And lastly, what is the best advice you could give someone starting their solopreneur journey right now? Uh, make sure that you really look at your business as a business endeavor where you have identified a market where you are offering a product or service that is really critical, where there's, there's some kind of um, precedent that it's going to be something that's viable and I do sound a little bit, you know, crotchety wagging my finger, but there have been so many people who are just focusing really on the benefit to the solopreneur. Like I want a life this way and I want to be able to pick up my kids and be on the beach. And I'm sitting there thinking, and what about your customers? And like a business is a business that needs to be solving a problem. So absolutely set it up in a way where you can enjoy your life but that is not the primary reason why people will give you money is so that you can have the kind of life that you want to live you got to be delivering something of value as well absolutely well said my friend well thank you so much pam for being here with us and you know each of you brought some very, very interesting perspective tonight, but all of it, I felt nourished my soul. And I'm really excited now to bring all of my guests back. So I'm going to welcome back Patrick Dewar and Ojinga Carr, along with Pamela Slim, because we are going to have a little panel that I like to call Hit It and Quit It. Okay, so this is how it's going to work. I'm going to ask each of you a question and you have less than 30 seconds to answer and you can't repeat the answer of anyone else but you all are going to answer the same question got it got it all got right it. all right got so it. here's what we're going to do the first question is going to come to you patrick and then the next question and then that question is going to go to pam and then ojinga all right so we're going to do it that way and so our very first question, Patrick, is coming to you, and it is, what is your favorite business app? What is your favorite business app? My favorite business app is uh, Zoom. Uh, for the kind of work that most of us uh, do in consulting and speaking, and when you're working with client interaction, uh, I like All right, um, Pam, I'm coming to you. What is your favorite app? I think you told us some earlier, but come back and give me your, your ultimate favorite. You know, I'll say in the spirit of what Patrick was talking about for learning Audible, I have become a voracious consumer of audiobooks, and it's so helpful in business learning. I love this Automobile University. That's so super brilliant. And I love my Audible. I love it. I love it. All right. Ojinga, what is your favorite app? My favorite app right now is Kajabi um, because I use Kajabi to build online courses. Um, and that's such a, a big way of being able to stretch your reach um, in the way that Pamela was talking about, about stretching and being able to not be the person who's giving everything, to, doing all the work. So being able to do that work and create it. So Kajabi's got to be my favorite one right now. All right. That's really, really good stuff. 
All right, Pam, I'm coming back to you first with this next question. What is your favorite old school marketing tip? Pam, I'm going to start with you. Then I'm going to go to Virginia. Patrick, I'm coming to you last. Pam. I love like actual business research and proactive outbound lead generation. Like it never fails. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with identifying who it is in your community that you think would be a great prospect, researching about them, making a list and having a very uh, appropriate way to address them. Inbound is great, but there is nothing like old school outbound. So picking up the phone, dialing for dollars, that's what you're talking about, Pam? I usually actually introduce first as an email because I hate getting an a unsolicited phone call so very much that I feel like a lot of people do, but it's often being strategic to how it is that I could get a connection with somebody that I have looked forward to identify that could be a good link in the business. I like it. I like it. And LinkedIn is a great way to do that. Exactly. All right. Oh, Jenga, what, what do you got? What's your favorite old school marketing tip? Be a magnet. That's something that's so important, like really just using your brand and who you are to magnetize yourself, to bring people to you. Um, so it's important about, like I said, about stories in your business, about the stories it is you're telling, because it is who you attract. And so being a magnet so you, you can attract the customer it is that you want to be able to attract. Love it, love it, love it. All right, Patrick, what is your favorite old school marketing tip? speaking and i mean what i mean by that is i think all of us need to learn how to present more effectively we whether you're in leadership or sales you're in the act of persuasion when you learn how to present better more effectively then you communicate in a way that you tell your stories to create the attractor factor for your business get out there and find places to speak you can always start with Toastmasters and then go to Lions Clubs and and uh, uh, Kiwanis or whatever. I mean, you know, Chamber of Commerce, there are places that will welcome you to speak in their presence. Learn how to present more professionally because whether you're doing one on one or one on 300, you're always making a presentation. I love that. I love that, Patrick. And I feel that. And my favorite old school marketing tip is actually to write somebody a handwritten note after you've met them. You know, so often we're so quick to send an email or connect to somebody on LinkedIn, but I love to, I still have small biz lady stationery and I will write out a note and mail it to somebody and you would be amazed how people remember you for even the most small, a little small gesture like that. All right, Ojinga, I'm coming to you first with this next question. What is your favorite podcast? What is your favorite podcast? And Patrick, get ready because I'm coming to you next. And then Pam, you're last. What's your favorite podcast? My favorite podcast right now is uh, HPX Life um, with one of my mentors, Brendan Burchard. And so really gives me that positive um, out, output and gives me those really good tips in order to be able to use uh, HPX Life. HPX Life. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Patrick, what about you? What's your favorite podcast you're listening to? This will sound like a, a suck up to Ojinga, but it's his. I love to hear Ojinga speak. You know, he introduced me to you, Melinda, and and so yours is going to be next, obviously. But uh, now, I, I the funny thing is, is like like Pam was saying, I listen to a lot of books because uh, I'm in the car three or four hours a day, going from city to city. I do 200 workshops a year. Wow. All right. Well. I love it. I love it. And Pam, what's your favorite podcast? I like my friend Jonathan Fields, a good life podcast. So he has a really nice mix of very thoughtful interviews with a lot of authors and speakers. And I just love the care that he puts into the questions and just the variety of different kind of guests that he brings on. Awesome. 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 And my favorite podcast is actually one of our other friends. His name is Barry Maltz. It used to be called the Business and Sanity Podcast. Now he gave it a more refined title, but I love Barry Maltz, Barry Maltz's uh, podcast. I listen to it all the time. Um, all right. So uh, this question actually is coming to you, Ojinga, first. Um, how do you stay motivated? And then I'm going to go to Pam and then Patrick, we're going to end with you. How do you stay motivated? What do you do? 
Well, we do what we like to call the 420s in the morning, uh, 20 ounces of water. But before this is before I ever touch my phone, 20 ounces of water um, to do so. Um, 20 minutes of reading out of an actual book. So not off of a tablet or any electronics with that. Uh, 20 minutes of stretching and like body activation. And then 20 minutes of actually visualizing the day. How can I do today well? So this is my second time doing this, this, this podcast today because I already envisioned how can I do it well to be able to do it. So hopefully it worked out. There you go. <laughs> I think it's working for you. I do. I do. I think it's working for you. That's it. That's it. <laughs> All right. And um, Patrick, how do you stay motivated? So I found years ago that the first 20, first 30 minutes of the day and the last 30 minutes of the best day, best times of the day to program your unconscious. And so I will spend at least 30 to 40 minutes a day just beginning to create the con the internal conversation the affirming, the saying the right things about my day and seeing it like what Jing was talking about. But your unconscious, that's the time period when your mind is opening up and the unconscious is shutting down while the unconscious in the last 30 minutes is opening up while the conscious mind shuts down. That's the time to program the unconscious. And I do that every day. I love it. I love it. All right, Pam, how do you stay motivated? I remember why I'm doing the work. So it always motivates me to know what it is that I'm building and who I'm, <clears throat> who I'm doing it for. And uh, if ever I start to lose sight of that, it brings me right back to lots and lots of motivation. I love it. I love it. And, you know, I have a couple of things I do to stay motivated. Sometimes it is music that motivates me. Like the biggest thing that's motivating me right now, my favorite song um, that Alexa likes to play for me is, is, is Love Theory by Kirk Franklin. I love that song. And it just, it just, you know, it gets me, it gets me. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then the other thing that I do is before my feet even hit the ground in the morning, I pray. And then after I pray, I, I meditate on my day and visualize my day through meditation. And that is something that centers me so that no matter what comes at me, you know, whether my son doesn't brush his teeth and I have to tell him five times to do it before we're leaving the house or whatever, um, I don't let that rattle my day. I don't let that ruin my day. I'm able to pat, you know, push through my day doing that. All right. Last question, guys. Uh, what's the best book you ever read? Pam Slim, what's the best business book you ever read? And then Patrick and Ojinga, we're going to end with you. This is counterintuitive, but Bad Blood, man, what a great book. And it basically was the recipe uh, about the Theranos story of like every way not to be in business. And it was so fascinating, well told. And I think there's a ton of business lessons. Good stuff. Good stuff. Patrick, what about you? The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. And when I first got into selling uh, right out of college, I spent nine months reading that book. And if you ever read the book, you'll find out why I spent nine months on it. And it lays the foundation of reading each day with love in your heart and really out to do people good because selling is serving. Persuasion is serving. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Oh, Jenga, what's your favorite business book? Uh, it's called The Game by Serrano Kelly. It's an old book um, and it's uh, Win Your Life in 90 Days. And it really taught me about chunking up my life and my years and those different things as far as that. Not thinking of a year, but thinking of four 90 day um, runs and being really focused about the things I wanted to be able to get done. So I love it. And then there's Fix Your Business, which is really my favorite bi business. Oh my book God, ever. we all should have seen it. Like, oh my God. Oh my God. Fix your business. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you flatter me too much. <laughs> and of course, I have to tell you that my book is The E Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. It's absolutely my favorite. Love him and love that book. It changed my life. Uh, listen, you guys, thank you so much for being a part of Small Biz Chat Live tonight. Thank you so much to Patrick Dewar, Ojinga Carr, Pam Slim. I consider all you guys friends and I thank you for consider it not robbery to be here with me tonight. If you guys want more information about the three of them and how you can work with them, check out my blog, succeed as your own boss.com. I am Melinda Emerson, the small biz lady, and I will leave you with this. You never lose in business. Either you win or you learn. I'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>
God bless.